We're going to spend time in God's Word today. We're doing a sermon series on the Ten Commandments. We're on commandment number nine. So join me in Exodus chapter 20. And today, uh, the title of the message is Avoiding Perjury. So we're in this commandment that speaks of the need for us to tell the truth. Now, over the past year, I have had many opportunities to speak with lawyers who are defending us or who are weighing in on the circumstances of our world. And one of the disturbing things that at least two lawyers have told me personally is that our courts in Canada aren't so much about justice anymore. Surprise, surprise. But in large part, they are interested more in mediation. They are making rulings based upon public opinion and political correctness. So, for example, when one lawyer recently asked a judge, why is there so much discrepancy between the way churches and small businesses are being treated, who are being locked down and facing exorbitant, like over-the-top fines and threatens of, threats of jail time, and then over here you have all these mass protests taking place and various public officials are participating, the response was, well, you're just playing schoolyard politics. In other words, you're being immature. So this is the state of our country, and it should concern us. Now, the Bible has something to say about justice. So if you're in church today and you're like, ah, church is just about getting people to heaven. It's just about, you know, we don't need to worry about the circumstances of this world. We don't need to worry about legal systems or politics. That has nothing to do with the church. The gospel's just about getting people saved and getting them to heaven. Then you're going to have trouble explaining why we have commandment number nine in the Ten Commandments. Because God is very much concerned about justice. He's concerned about law and order. He's concerned about societal constructs. So before we even get to Exodus 20, we can go to Deuteronomy 10. And in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, it says, He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. That's very much of a here and now theology. God is concerned about here and now, not just about the future. He's concerned about here and now. He's concerned about justice for the widow, for the orphan. He's concerned about people being fed and clothed. God is concerned not just about eternity, but he's also concerned about the here and now. And he has a lot to say in the word of God about how we as the people of God participate in his movement in the world to make sure that the widow and the orphan are being taken care of, to make sure that people are being fed and people are being clothed. So justice is a concern for God. One of the most oft-quoted passages in our generation is Romans 13. It has eclipsed by far John 3.16 as the most popular verse of the last year or so. And even there, in Romans 13, it reminds government officials, that they bear the sword, that the evildoers should fear them, that they're responsible to uphold public justice, to reward the righteous, and to punish the crooked, the criminal. And yet we have seen plenty of situations in Western culture where that equation has been flipped, and the righteous are being persecuted or falsely accused by those that bear the sword, And the evildoer goes free because they hired the right slick lawyer who lied in court or manufactured evidence or whatever it might be. We know, because we have thousands of years of history behind us, that nations that do not uphold justice eventually crumble. Always happens. You can study it. There's no nation on earth that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years that isn't committed to justice. So God's word is the place we go to to understand what justice is, how courts should function, right and wrong, the foundation of all of society. We'll just spend time in one of those verses today, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16. There are many other passages about jurisprudence, about justice, about righteousness, but this is one that's pretty core. And it says there in God's word, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Most Sunday school teachers paraphrase this to the effect, well, you shouldn't lie. Well, it's true you shouldn't lie, but this verse is very specifically addressing 
perjuring oneself in court. It's addressing lying in court. Yes, by implication, you shouldn't lie. But this is a very specific passage aimed at upholding justice, making sure the legal system, the court system is functional. So what do we need to understand about this? We need to understand that God is not just concerned about spiritual matters, futuristic matters, but he's also concerned about law and justice and order in the here and now. So the next time someone says, oh, churches shouldn't weigh in on public issues. Churches shouldn't get political. Churches shouldn't speak into culture. The gospel is just about eternal life. Take them back to Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, and ask them to explain why God speaks about perjuring oneself in court. So the gist of the command, sort of to put it into modern language, is that honest courts, and by extension, honest relationships, are fundamental to a functioning society. So let's talk about this a little bit. The backbone of justice systems has always been primarily throughout history, up to recent times, the truthfulness of eyewitness testimony. So if you've been accused of something and you're in court and you're trying to defend yourself, people bring in eyewitnesses to either accuse you or declare you to be innocent. It's foundational. Now, we, we've sort of forgotten how important this is in modern times because we have all these crime scene investigators. And they come in with their kits and their chemicals and swabs and fingerprinting. And they look at DNA evidence and they look at fingerprints and hair samples and all these sorts of things in order to build a case. And while there's some benefit to that, we all know that sometimes they get it wrong. And you have someone that's in jail that you know, is eventually let out, declared to be innocent because they were, you know, they got the evidence wrong. The, the, the DNA was corrupted or something like that. But prior to all of these modern inventions where you're maybe monitored for criminal activity on the internet or you're caught in a surveillance camera or your DNA is found in a crime scene, legal systems relied fundamentally on eyewitness testimony. And so this is why this command is given. This is why it makes it into God's top 10 list. If you bear false witness in court, if you lie, say, well, I I saw this person murder so-and-so, but they didn't, or I didn't see them murder anybody and they did, the whole court system collapses and there's no justice in the land and law and order quickly falls apart. So this is so fundamental. We may not think about this as being super important, but in God's mind, it's so important that it wound up in the Decalogue. So we need honest courts. One glaring example of a failure to uphold this commandment was the Israeli king Ahab. Remember him? Ahab was, I would just call him a punk. He was a selfish punk. And he had all kinds of power and prestige and money, but it was never enough. And looking over the fence one day, he started to to eyeball and covet Naboth's vineyard. And he went to Naboth and he asked him if he'd buy it. We talked about this a few weeks ago in another sermon. Naboth said, not interested. It's actually kind of inappropriate for Ahab to even offer to buy him, buy his land, because land was supposed to be passed on with, within various clans. You weren't supposed to sell it to anybody. So he's breaking other laws by asking him. But nevertheless, Naboth says no. Ahab goes back, starts pouting. Him and his wife concoct this scheme And in order to get the land, they hire a couple liars who perjure themselves in court and say, yeah, this guy, we saw him blaspheming God. And so Naboth is dragged out and he's killed. So 1 Kings 21, verses 13 to 14, here's what it says. And the two worthless men came in and sat opposite of him, that is Naboth. And the worthless men brought a charge against Naboth in the presence of the people saying, oh, Naboth cursed God and the king. So they took him outside the city 
and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent to Jezebel, his wife, saying, Naboth has been stoned, he's dead. And Ahab goes in and he takes over the land and he starts to enjoy the, all this for grapes and wine. Think about that. So this is a glaring example where the theocratic king, who's supposed to represent the purposes and plans of God, breaks the ninth commandment in order to procure for himself land that he should never have owned in the first place. Now, there's many times in history where that situation has repeated itself, and this lie costs a man his life. So this is why it's so important. The consequences of lying in court are catastrophic. This is first-degree premeditated murder. Now, let's fast forward into the present. Could that ever happen in our society? You know, it's interesting. We have criminal lawyers, and we're, you know, we're, we understand that people deserve a, a, a proper defense. But we, we do see at times criminal lawyers literally concocting schemes to try to get someone off of a crime they committed, blatantly concocting lies so that criminals get lenient or no sentences at all. I remember years ago in my hometown of St. Thomas, there's a story of a man, this is just unbelievably repulsive, who molests his five-year-old daughter in front of his computer camera, streams it out on the internet for perverts to watch. And at the end of the day, he got something like 34 months in jail for it. I might go to jail for four years for opening my church for a few hours. This is the state of our culture. And it should disturb all of us. You know, we stand in court and we're asked the question, do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Everyone, yeah, I know, of course I do. Now notice no one wants to swear on the Bible anymore. They want to swear on their own authority. Wouldn't want to swear on God's authority. Wouldn't want God's law to be recognized in culture, right? But we take this oath and then lies prevail in our courts. So we need to make sure that you know, we're truth tellers in our relationships, that we're truth tellers in our time in court, and that we leverage whatever power or opportunities we have to speak out against legal corruption. It matters. We need to be vocal about this, to speak out against the corruption of the systems that knit society together. And if we don't, if we're like, well, that's not my thing. I'm not a lawyer. It's, it's nothing to do with me. I'm not, I'm not affected by it. People could die as a result of our silence. Think about that. If we allow our court systems to be corrupted. So se several ways for us, of course, to engage ourselves. Here's a few I'd like to present to you. Uh, the Christian church needs to be engaged politically. We're not talking about partisan politics, but the church needs to be engaged politically. Politics are just the structures that hold society together. Of course, we're interested in that. So we need to hold politicians accountable who are liars. If a politician lies, they need to be held accountable for that. And unfortunately, there are a lot of liars in politics. And a lot of them get away with it because no one ever calls them out on it. The Christian church, we're just silent. We're supposed to be God's representatives in this world, holding the world to account for truth and righteousness. Oh, we don't, we don't wanna, we don't wanna get political. And look what's happening around us. So we need to hold them accountable. We see this taking place across our land. You know, the old line, laws for thee, but not for me. Many of our rulers are acting this way. Well, th these are the laws for you, if we're going to crack the whip on you if you break these laws. But, you know, we got our own set of laws. And, and basically, they come in the form of a blank page. We can do whatever we want. So when we allow the highest levels of society to lie, to bear false witness, to cheat, to break the law, we allow falsehood to flourish. So this is why we speak boldly against leaders that lie. Verbally, one-on-one -on -one in our relationships, we should be marked by truth-telling. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, at times you might say yes and then forget. You have to apologize. 
But the idea here is if you say yes and you actually mean no, you're lying. If you say no and you mean yes, you're lying. So in business, in court, in politics, in relationships, Christian people need to be marked by honesty. Sadly, people are so used to the lies, the spin taking place in culture today, that have you noticed people are more offended when you speak the truth bluntly than when you lie all the time? You get more flack for just telling people the truth than when you're a liar. This is the state of our nation. We need to be factual in the way we communicate to one another. I've seen several relationships damaged or find themselves in tension because one person accuses another person of something without evidence, but it's like, well, I just sort of, it's, it's based upon my intuition. Well, I, I think they're this or I think they're that. What's, what's your evidence for your accusation? Well, the Lord told me in a dream. Well, that doesn't cut it. That's not what the command says. If the Lord tells you in a dream, you need to be an eyewitness testimony. So we need to, be, we need to make sure that we are not complicit in fake news cycles with regard to our interaction with one another. By the way, sidebar, there's so many crazy things taking place in our culture. We also need to be careful what we believe and what we you know, receive into our minds and then pass on. There's a lot of weird things taking place in our culture. We shouldn't just believe everything that the prime minister, the premier, the mayor, the health director says. We need to be discerning, but nor should we believe everything that we see on Facebook or Twitter because someone's got a video going around. You know, it supposedly explains everything that's taking place in the world. So we, we want to be people of truth and make sure that we're fact-checking things and not inadvertently spreading lies. We need to be careful what we say, the information that we pass on. If we make a mistake, we retract it or we apologize because there's lots of information being passed around. But the point is this, while falsehood may be a daily part of the lives of many unbelievers, Christians are called to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Which brings us to a second application of the commandment. So let me just say this again. The commandment primarily and fundamentally is about bearing false witness in court and making sure that we have an honest judicial system. But there are some implications for relationships. So while we stand for honest courts, we also need to stand for honest relationships as we spend time with one another, you know, rub shoulders with one another, so to speak although apparently that's not allowed right now, as we social distance six feet apart from one another, which I can see you're all doing quite well, six, six, six mouse feet. It brings us to a second application of this commandment. So we have several things to be aware of, which kind of are part of this whole idea of lying and truth-telling with regard to personal relationships. So first of all, let's make sure we avoid slander. Slander is a form of lying. What is slander? Biblically, slander has been defined as the utterance of false charges or misrepresentations which defame or damage another's reputation. Can't remember the source, but I think it's a great definition. The utterance of false charges or misrepresentations which defame or damage another person's reputation. Now, I counted over 30 situations in the word of God where slander is forbidden or negatively portrayed. And it's never portrayed positively. It's a sin. There's nothing redemptive about slander. In Romans 1, for instance, it appears in a list of sins, along with things like hating God and inventing evil. So it's, it's, it's a pretty nasty thing to do. In James's book, the epistle of James, chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, it says, Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge. Hey, by the way, that's kind of important. There's only one lawgiver. <laughs> you can't make up your own laws, folks. Laws, laws are not concocted by democratic process. God, as the creator, determines what's right and wrong in societal structures. That's a little sidebar. There is only one lawgiver and judge, 
the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So this is a, a, a passage that reminds us, hey, let's make sure we're not slandering others. Let's not, let's not spread false li- falsehoods or lies about other people. Let's be careful with our words. Deceit is also another manifestation of lying. To deceive someone is to trick them or deliberately mislead them. Now listen to this, really important, because a lot of people aren't, aren't nuanced in this regard, but we need to be. To deceive someone is to trick them or to mislead them in a sinful way. There are times when we should deceive people. Bet you never thought you'd heard that in church. But it's true. For example, remember Rahab? Knock, knock, knock. Where are the spies? We want to kill them. Don't know. Not sure what you're talking about. Well, she winds up in the hall of fame, the hall of faith, part of the lineage of Christ. She withheld the truth from wicked men. When someone has the truth, when someone's looking for the truth, but they intend to use it to destroy life, we don't give them that truth. We don't don't give them information that they will use to go and destroy people's lives. So this is a, a form of deception, but it is a righteous deception. It's withholding truth from someone who will use truth to create great abominable acts of wickedness. So we don't deceive. The story was told that many years ago, the Port Authority of New York decided they were going to run an ad and they were, in, in the ad, they were basically looking for electricians. They wanted to hire a bunch of electricians to install this new product called song tag connectors. So they, they basically put out an ad that said, we're looking for people that have special training in song tag connector, whatever, electrical technology, and please submit your resume. Well, they had 170 resumes given to them from people claiming to be experts in this. Song tag connectors don't even exist. The Port Authority made it up as a research project to see how many fraudulent resumes they receive on average when they put out requests for jobs. So this is, this is the state of the world where people lie on their resumes. We, every, every once in a while, you hear some crazy story of some medical doctor that never went to school <laughs> and he's you know, passing himself off as a medical doctor or whatever it might be. We need to ask ourselves, do we deceive people to get ahead? Are, are we honest when we apply for jobs or sell a product to a customer? Or do you use your trickery to get ahead? Do you stretch the truth? Do you just deceive others through deliberate silence or the use of innuendo or carefully selected words that might sound convincing and true but are false? No, we shouldn't do that. We're not forked tongued. We should be straightforward in the way that we communicate. And then we have just plain old lying. Lying is the blatant replacement of truth for untruth. That's out of bounds for the Christian. You know, the the classic childhood sin which generates taunts like liar, liar, pants on fire. (laughs) This often extends into adulthood and the lies are everywhere. Now, usually they're subtle. They're slickly marketed so that you believe them. Or if you're a little tired, you aren't paying attention. By the way, I think it's super important to teach our children to spot lies. A friend of mine mentioned in one of his podcasts that when he is watching cartoons or children's shows with his daughter, She's a young girl. He was telling the story on one of his podcasts about how they were watching one of the Frozen movies. Never seen it, but apparently they're popular. And um, by the way, how many men in the room over the age of uh, 25 have seen Frozen? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, Don't lie in church. Don't lie, folks. Put it up. Public shaming. Public shaming. Okay. <laughs> so he's watching this, and, and what he would do is every time there'd be a, a lie a falsehood told, he'd pause it and he'd say, hey, honey, can you spot the lie? You know, usually something about 
your worth or your value being rooted in your appearance or whatever it might be. So what's, what's he doing? This is a genius parental tactic. Hey, can you spot the lie? Can you spot the lie? He's training his child young, spot the lie. What's the worldview? What's the falsehood that's being taught? How many of us do that? How many of us live our lives looking for the lies? There's a lot of them around. Lying is, is pretty common. Have you ever told a white lie? What is a white lie? Is that like white adultery, white murder, white covetousness? No such thing. A lie is a lie. I came across a story several years ago of a lady named Alice Grayson. She was new to a church. She was baking this cake for this women's event. And she wanted to, you know, impress and kind of fit in with the crowd. So she got her ingredients. She whipped up this cake batter. She put it in the oven. You know, she was kind of in a rush. And it came out and the center just collapsed. Well, this cake was going to be part of an auction at her church to raise funds for whatever. So she thought, well, I don't have time to make another cake. It looks terrible. So she went to the bathroom and got a roll of toilet paper and jammed it in the hole of the cake and then iced the whole cake. And her thinking was, I'll drop it off at the auction and I will make sure I'm the one that submits the highest bid so no one will ever know, but I'll look like I participated in it, etc. So she drops it off. She shows up at the auction. She gets the time wrong. The cake is sold. So she's terrified that she's going to be busted. Well, a day or two later, she was invited to some sort of a, a wedding shower or bridal shower or whatever it might have been. And she shows up at this lady's house in the church. And lo and behold, there is the cake <laughs> sitting on the table. So, of course, she's terrified, thinking she's going to be busted. And, you know, her reputation was going to be destroyed until she heard the hostess proudly declare, I hope you like the cake. I baked it myself. <laughs> So she was vindicated. <laughs> well, you might get away with a lie a few times, but eventually it'll catch up to you and make you look like an absolute fool. And just keep that in mind. Finally, how about promise breaking in marriage? People often break their vows. In church ministry assignments, they break their vows. In parent-child relationships, they break their vows. The temptation to make promises and break them is always there. But on the contrary, Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, and I've mentioned this already, let, you, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. No trickery, just the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Finally, we need to understand the consequences of lying pretty significant. How serious is God about this commandment? Big deal. Not so much of a big deal. Slap on the wrist or something more significant. Well, you can find your way to Deuteronomy 19. And in Deuteronomy 19 verses 16 to 21, we see the consequences of bearing false witness. Here's what the word of God says. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, the ultimate judge, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days, and the judges shall inquire diligently, in other words, do their work, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother." So you shall purge evil from your midst and the rest shall hear and fear and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. It's a pretty big deal to fail to tell the truth. So may we be a people that tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, the people that are marked by honesty and truth-telling in our relationships and our churches. 
but also when we stand for righteousness and justice and honesty in the legal systems that surround us. Honesty is a vital component to building a properly functioning family, properly functioning nation, and obviously it should go without saying a properly functioning church. So let's do our part to maintain a strong justice system based on truth and strong relationships with one another, void of slander, deceit, lies, and broken promises.